The Lord be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Reclining at table with his disciples, Jesus was deeply troubled and testified, Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another at a loss as to whom he meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said to him, Master, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I hand the morsel after I have dipped it. So he dipped the morsel and took it and handed it to Judas, son of Simon, the Iscariot. After Judas took the morsel, Satan entered him. So Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now, none of those reclining at table realized why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Jesus had told him, buy what we need for the feast, or to give something to the poor. So Judas took the morsel and left at once, and it was night. When he had left, Jesus said, Now, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him at once. My children, I'll be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me. And as I told the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Master, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now though you will follow later. Peter said to him, Master, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say to you. The cock will not crow before you deny me three times. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You will look for me, but where I go, you cannot come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How do you know, you know that, that someone loves you? I suppose they could tell you that they love you, but would you believe them necessarily? Or maybe they depend on you, or, or rather maybe they like the fact that you do things for them. Does that show that they love you? Maybe not. Or maybe they need you to do things for them. I hope I'm not getting muddled now. You know, do you remember the musical Oliver Twist? There's a beautiful song sung by the character of Nancy, Because He Needs Me. And she sings this beautiful song about how she knows that he loves her because he needs her. But of course, the he that she's talking about is, what's his name, Bill Sykes or something? The man who beats her up all the time and eventually kills her. Because he needs me. 
Is that proof also that he loves you? We can do a thought experiment. Think about the people who come around and visit you or talk to you. There are some people you know, they only get in touch when they need something. And when they come, I mean, you're willing to help them out, but in your mind you think, ah, they need something. Okay? You don't start to imagine that they really genuinely love you. You just know that, you know, they're acquaintances, not really friends, but they need you, and then, and maybe you do the same for them. You only go around when you need something. So someone needing you is not proof that they love you. God is perfect in himself, eternal, complete, needing nothing. He needs nothing. He's already perfect. Does God need us? Does God need you? Yeah, the answer is no. He doesn't need us. He does not need us one bit. Nothing. God does not need Father Leon. Amen. Oh, I can't say the A word. H word. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. He does not need me. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. He can do it through other people. He doesn't need a single one of us at all. This is how we know he loves us. Because he doesn't need us. And he still went and died for us. He made us knowing, out of love, knowing it is good for us to exist. And he died for us because he loves us. So this is the proof to us that God loves us. He does not need us. Now, does this mean that we therefore do nothing for him? No. Our joy is in serving God, not in ourselves, not serving ourselves. God himself, now I want you to think very carefully about this, because God himself doesn't need us, but we need him. We need to love God for our sake. We need to praise God for our sake. Not for his sake. He doesn't become bigger and happier. He's happy that we are happy, but our happiness lies in him alone. Okay? Now God himself cannot be harmed, but we can be harmed. So, for example, if someone steals the host from Mass and use it, uses it for a satanic Mass uh, or a black Mass, nothing happens to Jesus. He is not harmed, but that person is harmed. They damage their soul, the demons infest them, possess them probably, and they, if they don't repent, they'll go to hell. Okay, so they are harmed, Jesus is not harmed. This is why we are so careful with all the fragments of the host as well. Jesus is not harmed, but I would be harmed if I didn't care. If I didn't check for every single fragment of Jesus, it would show that I don't really care that much about Jesus. That would be bad for Father Leon, wouldn't it? It would. It would be very bad for me. You heard in the Gospel, Jesus takes the morsel, gives it to Judas, and when Judas receives it, it says, Judas took the morsel and left at once, and it was night. John tells us it was night, not just because it was night. It was night in Judas' soul. He took the Eucharist in a state of sin, of serious sin. When we do that, the devil comes and seizes that person's soul. This is why it's so dangerous. Now, when I say this, I'm not speaking to the scrupulous among you. Scrupulous ones, please cover your ears and don't listen to me. To the unscrupulous, remember, this is why we must go to confession if we have serious sins on our soul and not just receive communion. It's so dangerous. What happened to Judas could happen to us. And it happens to many people. Don't let that happen. Jesus cannot be harmed. We can when we do such a thing like that. Okay? Then Jesus says this, this beautiful thing. Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him at once. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are perfectly complete and happy. The life of the Trinity is in giving each person to the other, completely, unreservedly, in full measure. 
The Trinity is already perfect in itself. The glory of God is not what we seek to give God. The glory of God is not even the crucifixion. But the crucifixion, it's like, do you know what a piñata is? You know those Mexican toys, looks like a donkey or something, and you, at children's birthday parties, you hit it with a stick and all the sweets come out. You hit it and then you see what's on the inside. The crucifixion, oh, I'm sorry to call, compare Jesus to a piñata, but the crucifixion shows the inside of Jesus. Literally, his side is pierced. His heart is opened for us and out come forth blood and water as Jesus, after Jesus has breathed down the Spirit to us. That is the heart of, the, of Jesus. One of the Trinity is opened and we glimpse what goes on in the Trinity. The glory of God is that God is perfect and fully in love, perfect in himself. And that love pours out to us through the crucifixion in our redemption. Because the worst that the world can ever do, the worst thing the world can ever do is to kill God. And we already did that 2,000 years ago to Jesus. And what did it do for us? It opened the heart of God and showed us what love really looks like. I asked you, how do you know someone loves you? Well, there's one way, if they are willing to die for you. And if they do actually die for you. Jesus loves us. He laid down his life for us. Simon Peter says, Master, I will die for you. Why can I not follow you now? And Peter say, uh, Jesus says, he just answers with a question, will you actually lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the cock will not crow three times. But sorry, the cock will not crow before you deny me three times. When Peter will say, I never knew the man. And as we heard in the gospel a few days ago, Jesus, Peter calls down curses on himself. May I be cursed if I'm lying. What a thing to say. I never knew the man. It's only after the resurrection when Jesus appears to Peter by the side of Galilee on the lake shore. He says to him, do you love me more than these others? Three times. And then says, come follow me. And tells him, yes, you will actually die for me now. Now that you're humbled. Remember, the proof of love is not in someone needing us. The proof of love is that we have that kind of love that's willing to sacrifice ourselves. I love you so much that if it's better for you, I should go, I might go. If, it's, if I have to lay down my life for you, I will die for you. This is real love. This is the love that Jesus wants to give us. I never want any of you to doubt God's love. Do not doubt God's forgiveness either. If you do, for example, some of you confess your, the same sins over and over. I don't mean because you repeat them. I mean you confessed it 40 years ago, but you still can't believe you're forgiven. If this is true of you, you're saying, I don't really believe God loves me. And what is there God can't do? God died for you. Of course he loves you. Can God not forgive you? Does God not want to forgive you? And also, if you really think your sins are so bad, then I want you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, who the heck do I think I am? You know, who, who, who do you think you are? Join the club. You're like the rest of us. There are no great sinners. Sin does not make one great, to paraphrase Yoda. Okay? But there are great saints. Every sinner has a past. And every saint has a future. Oh, wait, I'm getting it wrong. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.